Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another video. So, Summer Nam 2022 in Anaheim. Weird to say that. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend Nam this year. Big sadness. No one was really sure before the show whether it would be worth it this year. Plus, I was on dad duty. It was a strange Nam this year. We all knew it was going to be. No Gibson, no Fender, no PRS. In fairness, Gibson has skipped out on NAM before, but none of the big three American companies, that's not happened ever. So just from talking to my other YouTuber friends and to my friends in the industry, it was really uneasy going into this year's NAM. So outside of just the announcements, this was going to be a really consequential NAM. So this year it was pretty low key, not the immense amount of hype that there's been going into winter NAMs in years past, but also not totally disappointing. There were some surprises. So I thought it would be fun to pick out and go through the most interesting things that caught my eye at this year's NAM show and then talk through some key takeaways, product trends, and where I think the future of NAM is headed. Let's jump into it. So the first thing that caught my eye Ernie Ball, Music Man. Gibson, Fender, PRS, they may not have shown up, but Music Man did. They dropped an entirely new model in the Kaizen, a collaboration with Tosin Abasi of Animals as Leaders, and who saw this one coming? Tosin has his own company, Abasi Concepts. He also has his own signature set of fluence pickups with Fishman. So no, no one saw this coming. If you say you did, you're a liar, or you're amazingly lucky and you need to get to Vegas immediately. The name is perfect. It looks exactly as you'd think it does with a name like Kaizen. Crazy angular shape, very stealth plane, very Lamborghini inspired. They're calling it decidedly contoured. Indeed, Music Man, indeed. It's also got Steinberger gearless locking tuners, which, okay, cool. Multi-scale tremolo, which is crazy. I've only seen Kaler do anything similar. And an infinity radius neck, which is a conical radius that, quote, increases comfort while maintaining enhanced visibility of the fretboard. So it's so spherical, it'll help you see the fretboard better. I can't even begin to imagine what that feels like, and to be honest, it seems like something that really needs to be experienced. Sadly, no Sterling version announced this time around, and there are no six string Kaizens, only seven strings. This is a gent only zone. 24 and three quarter inch to 25 and a half inch multi-scale angled neck pickup, weirdly non-angled bridge pickup, which is very bizarre because in relation to the bridge on a normal scale guitar, it would be like the neck pickup is angled the other way. So I would have thought that it will sound more like a middle pickup, for the bass strings? I don't know, man. Abasi's genius flies way above my head sometimes, so I'd love to check one of these out. Speaking of which, while everyone's talking about the new guitars, the new Kaizen, and the new Petrucci collection, we'll come to those in a sec, but we really need to talk about the new pickups first. Now, pickups are really old, theoretically very simple technology. There isn't that much room to really innovate with them, but Music Man has announced that their new guitars are coming with heat-treated pickups. Now, the idea behind these is that they've taken their material-based approach from the development of their Cobalt and M-Steel Slinkies and applied these findings to their pickups. The end result is that the pickups are more dynamic, more expressive, and higher output generally across the frequency spectrum. They're claiming tighter bass, expansion of higher frequency harmonics, in part also thanks to the magnets they're using. Powerful ceramic magnets in their humbuckers and even more powerful neodymium magnets in their single coils. I <laughs> struggled with that word. Hopefully that means a more balanced output when switching between the two though. Neodymium is a rare earth metal and magnets made of the stuff make for insanely hot pickups. It's not a totally new concept, but it is the first time, to my knowledge at least, a major brand has introduced them across their regular production line. Because it's not just the Kaizen, but an entirely new HT series encompassing the Cutlass, the Stingray, and the Sabre that have been given these new heat-treated pickups. And that's not where they're stopping with the electronics. You're also getting a 20 decibel boost circuit, transparent buffered output, which will give you consistent tone even when the volume is turned down on the guitar, and a mystical silent circuit where applicable that reduces single coil hum. Comes in a variety of colors. Love the Tunematic Stingrays with the black hardware and Sabres in blue and white with the roasted flame maple fingerboards in particular. I already love my Stingray RS. I think the pickups sound great in it. So if Music Man has somehow improved on that, these will be absolutely nuts. And the last thing from Music Man, they actually dropped a lot this time around, is that there is a new 2022 Petrucci collection. Now, I'm not the biggest Majesty fan, but holy sh**, the new ones look so fucking sick with the dark bodies and then flame maple veneers stained in bright colors. And then the maple top crystal amethyst? Even the JP15 is getting an extremely dope purple nebula finish. Like, fuck, dude, I wish I liked 
how these guitars play as much as I like how they look. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, Music Man has snuck this little announcement in that they're switching from hard cases to mono gig bags in Q3 of this year. You know, one, the hard case is more expensive. Two, it's bigger, it's heavier, it's more expensive to ship. So rising cost of everything, especially fuel, it makes sense that they're doing it. And Mono makes some great premium gig bags. Some people like them because they take up less space than hard cases. But yeah, if you want your Music Man with a hard case, get it before Q3. And speaking of getting it before Q3, the sponsor of today's video, Ridge Wallet. And they aren't just a sponsor, I actually use a Ridge Wallet every day. And that's because traditional wallets kind of suck and Ridge is redefining the wallet. Old school wallets just have this natural tendency to collect stuff. Old receipts, unused loyalty cards, business cards, you know what I mean. Well, that doesn't happen with the Ridge wallet. The designs are sleek, small form factor that can fit into your front pocket. The plates made of aluminum, titanium, or carbon fiber or RFID blocking to block scammers from stealing your information and they're held together by a durable elastic band. The quality is excellent and to back it up, each wallet comes with a lifetime guarantee. And Ridge isn't just streamlining wallets, they're now tackling out of hand keychains with their new key case. The expanding tension plate design is sleek, lightweight, and essentially turns your keychain into a Swiss army knife for keys. That's awesome. There are loads of colors and styles to choose from and they're always adding more. These are the new forged embered for specific carbon fiber models and they're my favorite yet. This is still Pringle's favorite. Father's Day is coming up, and if you want to give him the upgrade he deserves, head on over to ridge.com slash agafish and use the code agafish for 15% off your order and free shipping. That's ridge.com slash agafish, code agafish for 15% off. And of course, clicking the link supports the channel by letting them know that I sent you. And while you're doing that, let's talk more about Nam. Not to be outdone by Ernie Ball Music Man, Ibanez also took advantage of the lack of spotlight competition to unveil some new 2022 signatures. Some of the highlights, a new Steve Vai Pia in powder blue. Blue. Not gonna lie, that's my favorite one so far. Joe Satriani went from playing the Chrome Boy to the JS2 GD. I'm just gonna call it the Gold Boy because that's what it is. The Alder body is all gold. Pickup bobbins all gold. Even the frets are Jeskar Evo golds. And there are three switches to toggle each pickup on and off individually. Very, very cool. Last one that really caught my eye was the new Jake Bowen. Comes loaded with custom JBM9999 pickups and a 27 fret ebony fingerboard why but also yes get okay, why not i can't wait to hear what nonsense is on the next periphery album that makes use of this then switching gears real quickly to amps soldano and batik amp distribution dropped a new slo 30. apparently everyone on the internet got one i didn't so it came as a surprise to me too but not really a surprise because they've been doing these mini versions for all their most popular amps i am glad though that we saw some new stuff from batik amp distribution after the warehouse fire last year so it seems all is well the amp backlog is just due to the rest of the unending supply chain issues everyone else is dealing with. Relatively good news, uh, and also that sounds like a pretty dope little amp. Then anyone that's been around this channel for a while has probably heard me absolutely gush about the Eastman SB59V. Eastman is a small boutique builder, their workshop is in Beijing, and they just make some of the best guitars I've ever played. They started off as a maker of classical instruments before moving to guitars, and they use this violin varnish finish that is just absolutely incredible. It's like rocking a guitar that also feels like a played in cello. And they've just introduced a brand new Juliet solid body. I don't particularly like it. I'm sure it's based on some vintage design, but it kind of looks like a messed up melody maker. That being said, I love how they're taking their phenomenal violin varnish and doing something more out there with it instead of just less Paul inspired designs. Basically, the guitars are just so good that anything they drop instantly has my attention. And it's circling back Back to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning, Tosin Abasi's Abasi Concepts has its own announcement, a double cut model. Cool. So now everyone who complained about the big beluga whale on the top of the original Lerata can shut up about it, myself included. <laughs> I said it looked bizarre, but it seems to work for Tosin Abasi just fine. Either way, they've now got the double cut, which is cool. It looks slightly Strandberg puzzle piece-esque, but with a headstock. I was just really surprised to see two Tosin and Abasi guitar announcements from two different companies. Go on, Tosin, get that non-jiggle jiggle money. Now, those were the main things that really caught my eye. There were some honorable mentions, though. For example, Pete Thorne has a new signature, sir. I'm not really sure why this model caught my eye as much as it did. I mean, it looks very much like an HSS Strat. I guess the humbucker cover 
looks very cool. But I don't know, I guess I really like the pickguard shape that accommodates for a pickup ring around the bridge humbucker and all the combination of modern and traditional specs. Traditional neck shape, but stainless steel frets on a compound fingerboard radius. Two vintage style single coils, but paired with the new Thornbucker 2, an Alnico 2 powered humbucker that's been overwound for extra output. What can I say? I'm just a sucker for hot rotted sleepers. Then the Ciari Ascender, it's a folding guitar. Now that's not a new concept at all. I feel like we see something like this every NAM, and it's a great idea in theory, but a lot of them are either gimmicky or very expensive or both. Well, the Ciari Ascender Custom was on the premium edge of things and it's been redesigned with the help of Grover Jackson and Joe Glazer to be lighter and about a thousand bucks less expensive. It's still $1,800 though. <laughs> but making things simpler is a very good step in making great, reliable, and affordable mass-produced folding guitars. Another honorable mention goes to the ESP booth. This is one of my favorite places to go every NAM because of the custom wall where they just let their master builders run wild. Oh, man, it's just so cool every year. None of these have a prayer of making it into mass production and they're all outrageously expensive because they're custom one-offs, but when you see them in person, you realize you're in the presence of true artistry. My favorites this time were the Fire and Ice FRXs and the Stream GTs. The Rainbow Flame Maple Fingerboard. I'm not sure I'd ever want that specifically on one of my guitars, but I love the concept of a multicolor fade on a fingerboard. Yeah, super cool. And having that grand display at this slightly unorthodox NAM helped bring a sense of normalcy to the show, in a way. On the opposite end of cool, Phil X announced some stickers to make it look like your guitar is relic to sh Man, okay, so I've met Phil. He's a cool dude. He's an incredible player. This, I am not a fan of. Now, I love Relic's guitars. I love the way they look, but most importantly, I love the way they feel. Yes, they aren't actually old guitars, but the fingerboard edges are rounder, like on an old guitar that's been played in, which is super comfortable. The finish on the neck is thinner, like on an old guitar that's been played in, so it's quicker and less sticky. And yes, it looks like it's been beat to shit, so no one can tell what damage is from the factory and which is from unfortunate incidents with the walls. But this, I mean, you're just, you're just putting stickers on a guitar. It's not gonna give you the played in feel, which is, most of the point, in my opinion. So relicking is a hill I will gladly die on. This is not for me though. Okay, so obviously this year, everything was much more scaled down. Not as many releases, and I think that's because, well, one, brands didn't know how much consumer attention this show would really get. And two, the way that hype is generated in the industry is very, very different from when we last had an in-person NAM. The gear industry now kind of parallels the music industry itself. Album releases used to be a massive event and they still are a big deal. But the way music is released now, especially in the pop world, rock and metal, a little more traditional is through singles. It's all singles, it's all EPs. The competition for attention is so strong now, you can't afford to just release one album every two years and that's it. The singles are drip fed over time to extend the attention of your audience. And when the album finally drops, it's kind of well, a collection of the singles. And that's not a bad thing, it extends the life of the music you've made. Your audience can appreciate it one single at a time before they get to the next one. In the same way, Nam before was the event. Every brand would go announce all their sh for the year and just try to blow everybody away. But uh, due in part to the nature of the recent global situation, brands weren't able to get their entire lineup ready for the winter event. So much like singles, they were drip fed to us over the course of a year and brands realized, hey, we don't have to do this huge NAM blowout event. In fact, when we do that, a lot of cool stuff ends up getting buried. Releasing stuff piecemeal, one at a time, like singles or small collections, like an EP, everything gets its own time in the spotlight. Solar realized this a long time ago. Okay, so NAM is f***ed then, right? It's incredibly expensive for brands to go. Gibson can just release a YouTube video on an Adam Jones Silverburst Custom and that generates all the hype they need. Brands don't need NAM anymore. Well, no, because I think the function of NAM has fundamentally changed. The culture is we all pay attention to gear announcements and stuff around NAM time, and that's great, especially for smaller brands. But for the industry as a whole, NAM is the networking event. I would not be able to do what I do now had I not gone to NAM, talked to people, made friends. It's like an industry-wide 
company party. Forging relationships over a beer is not something that can be replicated over emails, over a Zoom call. And there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that people never see because the industry is relatively quite small and quite tight knit. The guitar industry basically functions because everybody, artists, brands, distributors, retailers, everybody knows each other. That's how things get done. And while there weren't too many huge product announcements this year, from what I've heard from my friends that did go, that networking aspect, that is very much alive and well. So I don't know, man. I don't think NAM is completely going away. I think it's far too important to the industry as a networking event, but the big flashy consumer focused spectacle, I hope it comes back because it's really fun. And also it's the part that you guys probably care about because what do you care about the industry wide party? It also helps grab mainstream attention from people outside of the industry. But realistically in the digital age, NAM as we knew it, it might be on borrowed time. Let's have to wait and see. But anyways, those are just some of my thoughts. I'd love to know what you think down in the comments. What did you think of this year's NAM? Did you watch a lot of coverage about it? What was the vibe you kind of got from the coverage? And what do you think is the future of trade shows like NAM? E3, uh, which is the video game equivalent, has basically been killed forever. And that's really sad too, because that was a big cultural event for the world of video games. So. I don't know, we're living in history. Like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't, tick the bell for notifications, that way you don't miss any new videos from me. Social media, Discord, and affiliate links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching, you've been awesome, and I'll see you for the next video.